So, I found this, I don't know about you all, but um, over the years, I've been to a lot of Bible studies. I've had a lot of teachers, and I think I've kept everything I've ever written down. When I go through, I have a big couple big tubs in the basement, and I start going through stuff. I have, I mean, I have, I can't even tell you how much I have written down because I didn't want to forget it, so I wrote it down. And now there it is, but I'm not. I don't want to throw it away because it's things that I learned. So I found, came across this the other day, and it says, "Faith is the ability to feel so sure of God that no matter how dark the day." There is no doubt as to the outcome. For God's people, there is a glorious future. It may be a long way off, but it is absolutely sure. Thus, in the midst of the gloom and the despair, we must trust that God is indeed faithful to His Word and His promises. Amen. Amen. And I don't know how long ago I wrote that. Um, and I don't know if it was some, someone said it, or as I was listening to what someone was saying, I wrote it down. I, I could not tell you. But it is faith is what we have. And faith is what gives us the assurance that no matter what, God still is who He says He is, yes? Yeah, yeah. We see tragedy all around us. We see the darkness. We see the evil. It is no longer hidden. But God is still God. That no matter what happens, no matter what comes, we know that Jesus Christ has won. There is no doubt that the end of the book says we are all going to be with him in heaven one day. The tests and the trials and the tragedies of this day will be no more. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. He will wipe away every tear. And we will be at peace with our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. That is our hope. That is all we can preach on. I got to thinking about the funerals that are coming up. That's where my brain goes with when things like this happen. And I'm like, Lord, how can you even preach at something like this? You preach on the hope of Jesus Christ. You give them hope that this is not all there is. That evil does not win. It does not win. The only way that it can win is if we let it. If we let it take us down. If we let it discourage us. If we, if we say, you know what? I can't, I can't do it anymore. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is in you. And He gives you the strength to overcome it. In Ecclesiastes, it, or, yeah, I think it's Ecclesiastes, there is a time. There is a time for everything. And there is a time to grieve. Why would the Lord have put that in the Word if, there, if we would never grieve? There is a time to grieve. There is a time to mourn. That means loss. That means we will lose those that we love. And he gives us the time to grieve. But then he gives us the time to dance again. And to laugh again. And he brings us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. How do we get there? How do we get to the point where when these things come, we stand for the name of Jesus Christ? When people say, why would God allow this? How could he let this happen? I'm going to tell you, in the beginning, God made man and woman. And he made them, it was good. And they made a decision. And sin and evil came in. And we still live in that in this world. 
sad to say. But we do. Death came in. Death came in. With sin, death came. The, the plan was man was to live eternal in the garden, eating the tree of life. But he decided he wanted to be like God. So he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin came in. And ever since then, when Cain killed Abel, the Lord said, don't do it. Sin is crouching at your door. Don't do it. Turn from it. He did it anyway. Sin has come in. But as the Lord has been with his people all through the word of God, the Lord is still with us. There has been tragedy and tests and trials. Think of the moms when uh, Herod went after the little ones, two year, little boys two years old and under, and killed them because he was afraid one of them was the Messiah. This is nothing new on this earth. It is how we learn to deal with it and face it and move above it and overcome it that makes us the church. It makes us who we are. The faith that we have makes us so sure that God is that the outcome is going to be good that God will take what Satan has meant for evil that the evil when evil came in that he will take what he has meant for evil and he will use it for good I know he will I know he will and if it wakes people up wake them up Lord are any of you guaranteed tomorrow? Wake them up, Lord. Let them see that tomorrow may not come. Are you ready to meet your Lord? In the world we live today, there are so many things that keep us from getting into a body of believers. There's sports, there's dance, there's, oh, there's all kinds of things. There's I'm sleepy. And I don't feel like getting up. Yes? Satan has caused this veil to be across this land that people uh, don't even think, don't realize the importance of being with a body of believers that like-minded believers that believe that Jesus is the Christ and that no matter what comes, we are together, we are in one accord, and we will be okay because Jesus is our Lord. So my prayer is that the Lord wakes them up, that he helps them see what is important, that to be in a body of believers, just like you saw this morning, where we surround each other, where they can run to when things like this happen, where we can be together as one and we can build each other up and we can help each other through these times. Our souls must be thirsty for God. We must thirst after Him. Now, so the other day, Wayne and I just got, Wayne says, oh, here we go. I'm sorry, Wayne. But he always gives me this material. Um, so we just got two new little steers, and um, they're so cute. Um, and we had them in the little paddock, and Wayne had a water trough for them to um, drink out of. So he would fill the water up every, sorry, Chris, I'll stay still. <laughs> um, so he had a water trough, and so he would fill it up every day for them, and they would come, and they would drink, and they knew where the water was. So the other day, um, he said, I'm going to turn them out on the bigger pasture. You know, well, they're, so, they're not very big. And I said, well, do you think they'll be all right? And, uh, you know, and he said, yeah, they'll be okay. Well, what if they don't find water, you know? Well, they'll find it. So anyway, he turned them out. And we were out there in the barnyard the other day. And, I, and they hadn't found the water yet. And I said, do you think you ought to take that little trough out there and fill it up with water? And, you know, so they can find He says, Karen... They have to be thirsty to teach them. 
like where the water is. They have to be thirsty. You have to let them get thirsty to find the water. You get it? They have to be thirsty. And I thought, oh, gosh, thank you, Wayne. He didn't even know he said it. Um, but it was just exactly, uh, it was like, it was this, like the Lord said, there you go. If the church is not thirsty, if people are not thirsty, they're not, you can't teach them. I've tried. I've tried to teach people that are thirsty. I want the thirsty, guys. I want the thirsty. I want the ones that want it. Because the Lord gives it to me to give to you. And then he's going to give it to you to give to others. And you're going to quench the thirst of others. Thirsty. Be thirsty for the word of God. If, um, if, you, if the tragedies that have happened uh, in the last few weeks, if the people that I know have been involved in these tragedies had not been thirsty, they would have never been able to stand. They would have never been able to get through what they have gotten through. You have to be thirsty. You have to be after it. You have to want more. Um, I'm going to go into John. For, and I'm sorry. This the scripture that I may go back to it. And Eddie, I appreciate you reading it. But um, we're going to go to John 4.13. So this was the woman at the well. And um, if you get down to 13, the woman at the well was asking um, Jesus about, well, let me just start at verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said, this water that I give you, you will never be thirsty again. This word of God that we have, if you take it and you drink it, you will never be thirsty again. You will have what it takes to persevere, to push through, to be a light in the darkness, to go into a situation and bring Jesus and the Holy Spirit presence into every situation. You will be able to, like Ashley in what she wrote, she's, God is still God. God is still good. He is still on the throne. And that will never, ever change. Never, ever change. God will always be the same. And he does see. And he does uh, uh, comfort us. And he does give us what we need. And he says, come on now. She's with me. He's with me. Now you keep going until you're with me. That's the way it works. Who in here is going to live forever? Here. There's no one. Lives are cut short. It's a terrible tragedy of our day. 
Millions of babies have been cut apart and aborted. It's a tragedy of our day. And God says, keep moving. Drink the living water that I give you, and you will have what you need. You will have all you need when you need it. The world is so lacking in this living water. People don't even understand what the living water is. There are children out there, that with the, like with the Child Evangelism uh, Fellowship, there are children out there that don't even know who Jesus is. What is the church doing? What are we doing? We're worried about what color, I say it all the time, I'm sorry, but they worry about the color of the carpet or what kind of roof we're going to put on the building or whose pew you're sitting in. Dad, going up, what is the church doing? If they don't come to us, then we go out to them. Jesus says, go out. Go and make disciples. Go and teach the children. What's going to happen to our dear children if the church doesn't go out and minister to the children? And teach the children there is a God. When tragedies like this happen, what, are, what, what happens to the children? And the church, this is the time when we must stand up. And we must make a stand. And we must go out and be the church of the Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Christ, no matter what happens, no matter where we have to go, no matter how he calls us, this is, this is the mission and the purpose of the church. If you're wondering what the mission and the purpose of the church, it is to preach Jesus. It is to give all that we know Jesus because he's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that can give us what we need when we need it. He's the only one that can quench our thirst. The world is looking for, in every direction, <laughs> looking for peace, looking for this, looking for that. I watched a little video this morning. Uh, Sister Kathy sends me these uh, little videos, and I try to grab them when I can. And it was, it's a fella, his name's Stuart. And he's just a real mild-mannered fella, but man, he has some powerful messages. And he was talking about, there's a church, he's over in England, and he's, there's a little church, and he was showing, and he said the church was, like, it was saying, come for fellowship and a magic show. They were going to have a magic show in the church to draw people in. Let's draw them in. How do we draw them in? Oh, let's have a magic show. Oh, for heaven's sakes, really? I was just like, I was appalled. But I'm going to tell you, that happens more than you know. Anything to draw them in. Anything to get them in. How about let's just preach Jesus and see what happens. Amen. Amen. When I was a little girl growing up, I had Sunday school teachers that taught me out of the Bible. And you know what? I wasn't too young to get that. And they said, I'm, you know, I guess they made up their mind. This is how we're going to teach. And they did. And praise the Lord God Almighty, they did. We are to be preaching Jesus to our children. And none of this wishy-washy fluff stuff. We make it so... <laughs> I know the Bible study group isn't going to laugh about that because we talked about that. Um, but uh, if we don't, then the world will teach them. The world will teach them what they want them to know. It was interesting when I saw the little video of how old, you know, how, like, we have to, like, the age 13, I guess, to get it really in the children's minds and hearts. And I thought, wow, we only have a little bit of time. It's not that older people can't be saved, but I'm here to tell you it's a lot harder <laughs> when you get older. And uh, if your heart, your heart gets hard, especially if you don't, you have never heard about it. You just think, well, that has got to be some kind of a myth. And I'll tell you, there's all kinds of false doctrine and false gospels out there that sound pretty daggone good. 
You know, so why not take this one? Which one should I choose? You know, let's see, that one has crystals. Oh, I love crystals. I love sparkly. Maybe I'll go that direction. Oh, this one tells me I'm a god. Well, I like that idea. Maybe I'll go with that. That should fulfill me. Beware of the false gospels and doctrine of today. And hunger and thirst for righteousness, for Jesus Christ. And drink of the living water that he gives you. Let's go into Psalms 2. Oh, let's see. Actually, sorry, Psalms 42, too. Looked at it wrong. There's so many promises in Psalms. It says, and I read this, I think, last week or the week before. As a, and I might have read it in my Bible study, in the Bible study, I'm not sure. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The living God. Do you know God is living? He is alive and well. And we are to be uh, thirsting after that. The living water, living. He is alive. And when we take him in, when we believe what he says, then that living water becomes part of who we are. And everywhere we go, we bring life. Because Jesus is in us. And I will say this, and it may sound a little bit morbid, but I can preach at a, at a funeral, and I can minister at a funeral, because people's hearts are open to something. They're just looking they're looking. All of a sudden, they've had to deal with death. And it makes them, whoa, it's true. Life doesn't go on here forever. And so it gives them, it like open, it gives you a window of time that you can speak truth and life to people and love them like Christ would love them, and give them the word of God that they so desperately need. This world is desperate for the word of God. They don't even know it. They don't even know it. But they are desperate for it. And I do believe that's why you see the hopelessness and the evil in this world. They did not start out evil. They started out in original sin, but they didn't, as they were babes, did not start out to be a killer. But somewhere, somewhere, Satan got a hold of them. And because the church has been so lethargic and so sleepy and so dead, if I must say, the Word of God has not gotten out like it should be getting out. So in these days ahead, Lord, help us all. And let us be the light. Let us take Him into the situations and not be afraid to go. Let us know that the Word that is in us will prevail. Let us know that the Word of God that is in us will give us what we need to speak comfort and love and truth to those that are grieving. And they need it. They need it so, so terribly bad. Let's go to Revelation 21, 6 and 7. I'm going to start at five. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the great I am. The Lord says, I am that I am. I am the great I am. I am the one. I am the one that you're looking for. I am the one that you need. He is the great I am. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The payment has been made. Jesus Christ paid the payment. If you are still living in sin, if you are still living in things that you should not be living in, Jesus Christ has paid the payment for it all. Wow. <laughs> I thought it was a little toy running around. Down there. <laughs> uh, verse 7 says, The one who conquers, now listen to this, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We have a heritage with our Lord and Savior. It is ours. Why don't we take it and run with it and give it to others? What, what are we afraid of? Why are we afraid to speak the truth to those that need it? Do you know that that may be the only time they get the opportunity to hear the gospel? What if we miss it? I think about that a lot. And so, uh, let's see, where else should I go here? John 6.35, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Wait, that's good. 6.35. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, you will never thirst if you come to me. You will never hunger. You will never thirst. Come to me. But you have to be thirsty for him to teach you. <laughs> you have to want it in order for it to to quench your thirst. It's just as simple as that. In Deuteronomy, it says, Today I set before you life and death. Choose life. What does that mean? <coughs> Choose the living water. Choose what Jesus has for you. If you are thirsty, come. Come and get what you need. If, are you weary? Are you weary? of the, the test and the trials of the day, then you need to come and get refreshed, renewed, given a new uh, strength and a new energy, a new joy deep down within, even through the bad and the hard times. God can do it. He can do it. He will do it. He, how about this? He wants to do it. He wants to do it. He wants you to never be thirsty again because he loves you. He does not want us to suffer. It grieves him when we grieve. He wants to comfort us. But oftentimes we turn against him. We blame him. Well, if he was a loving God, why would that have ever happened? Why would this have happened? Hello? We have an enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's what we do. And when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, and you become a child of God, the enemy wants to take you out just because you're his child. But see, God protects us, and he gives us the body. Why does it, not, why does it say in Scripture, it says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Do not not be in a body of believers that can pray for you, that can lift you up, that will stand with you in times of trouble. This is where we need to be together as one. 
And I'm talking about the body across this nation. Not just new beginnings. Not just new beginnings. So today, this morning, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity this morning because I know it's been a rough couple weeks for a lot of people. I've talked to a lot of people this week and last that there has been things going on in their life that they just feel like they cannot get through. But I'm going to tell you that you can if you drink the living water. If you decide that Jesus is your Lord. If you decide He is who you're going to follow no matter what. If you keep your eyes on Him, it says in Proverbs, keep your eyes straight ahead. Do not look to the right or to the left. Keep your eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> And He will sustain you. He will light your path. He will give you what you need to get through these days ahead. I pray for grace and mercy for these families that have lost dear ones. I pray God's comfort upon them. But I pray for workers to come into their lives to tell them the love of Jesus through the evil through the death and destruction. Because that is the only way that they will keep their head above water. It's the only way that you can get through it and come through it victorious. When uh, Jesus looked at Peter, he said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, Peter. But when you come through, then you go and you strengthen your brethren. Yes? All of us will go through if we have Jesus. We will all go through. And then we strengthen others with it. Because that's what the body of Christ does. That's what we do. We strengthen one another. We come together. You know, we don't come together just to have wonderful meals, even though that's great. We come together because Jesus is our Lord and Jesus is who we serve and we love each other. Jesus is trying to teach his church to love one another, to be with one another, to care with one another, and to pray for one another with a passion. Pray with a passion for our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> 